Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Resilient Advisor. My name is Jay Coulter, and joining me for this broadcast is Michael St. Louis, the founder of Sales Gym. And we're going to talk about a topic that most financial advisors struggle with. How do you increase your sales game? Being a financial advisor is first and foremost a sales game because you cannot serve people if you cannot sell them first. Michael, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, good morning, Jay. Thanks for having me on. All right. This is the first broadcast I have done on the topic of selling. And the reason for that is I always had this thought that advisors would struggle to want to listen to something about sales. After our pre-call, I know this is going to be an incredibly valuable episode for financial advisors. You had mentioned that you have seen four to 5,000 financial advisor interactions over the course of your career. Tell me, what have you learned from observing advisors during those sales interactions? Well, you know, Jay, when you look at uh, advisors, about, a, I don't know, somewhere between 10 and 20% of them, depending on the firm, are going to fall into that category of top performers. These are the people that you know generate by far the most revenue. They have the most high net worth clients. They have the highest closing ratio, all that kind of thing. And what you noticed when you observe them, both in live interactions and also in maybe practice simulations, is they do a few things quite different from the rest of the, you know, the rest of the advisors that aren't getting as good of results. But I think the, the most important thing that we noticed is they tend to be more concise in the way that they communicate. So especially on those initial uh, appointments where you're trying to turn a prospect into a client, you're trying to get to understand them and such, they end up talking less, they ask better questions, they listen more. And when it's time for them to communicate what it is that makes them unique, they're, they're just more concise and it has more punch. It's more a compelling, it's more magnetic. And as a result of that, the, you know, the prospect drops their guard, they start to open up and they can get past what I call the trap, which is talking entirely about your investments, you know, your allocations and such, because most, most prospects are not gonna switch, go through the hassle, especially high net worth prospects, are not going to go through the hassle to switch advisors unless there's a really compelling reason. And almost always it goes beyond, hey, I can allocate or find investments for you that can get a, you know somewhat better return. For most of them, that's not enough. You need more factors. That's right. Two things that I'd really like to unpack there because this comes up in every consulting engagement I have. Uh, number one, you talk about listening more than you talk. You know, early in my career, I was at Lehman Brothers when I, I was there during the collapse. But the best part about my experience with Lehman Brothers was the presentation training that I received mm -hmm. and in there. This was the same training that the investment banking team had. And they talked about the fact that you need to really be speaking about 25 percent of the time if you're going to get through the process, especially in those initial meetings. And I. Uh, Clearly, you feel that way. And then the other side is having everything scripted. And I get pushback from advisors on this because I encourage them to have you know, a story as to why they do what they do and then have it scripted when you describe what you do and the client's going to experience. Give us your thoughts on both of those. Well, I, th I think that, that it, it is really important to talk less than your prospect, or in many cases, even your client is talking, depending on the stage of the sales process. Obviously, if you're presenting your, you know, your portfolio and your, your, your suggestions and your ideas, you're going to be talking more. But in general, if it's somewhere around 50%, you're probably doing better than most. When we, when we actually time and in, in, interactions with lower performing advisors, they talk anywhere from 70 to 80% of the time. And that's almost always a non-starter. Wow. So the, the, the thing that the thing that they get into, the habit they get into, Jay, really, that is the kiss of death, is they just use a lot of closed-ended questions. They use this approach that we call kind of pitch and test. You know, they'll pitch an idea. Well, I've got a little bit of this, and we do financial planning. We do this. Would you like to hear more about it? And so it's like a closed-ended question where it's like the client says, well, yeah, or no, I kind of got that covered. And it shuts the conversation down. Really top performers ask these open-ended questions that open up the conversation. But in, 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 in you know, response to your second part of the question, which is scripts and such, I'm not a huge believer in memorized you know, scripts, especially at the level that you know advisors are selling at. Maybe if you sold, I don't know, smartphones or something, you might need kind of a script because those are it's a certain type of employee that's doing this but this is a very sophisticated style of selling but having said that i think you need certain core we call them headlines which is you know if i was to ask an advisor tell me what it is 
that makes you unique or special? What separates you from all the other advisors they could choose from? I think they need to have some of these short, punchy headlines that are maybe three, four, five seconds that they can punch out and then explain more in detail. So many advisors are more effective if they've got those short kind of headlines or value proposition elements or differentiating factors really dialed in, maybe not memorized, but pretty close to memorized. But the rest of it, I think you have to, you have to be able to spontaneously connect with the prospect. If you're, if you're in memory mode, you're probably not paying you know, close attention to what, uh, how your prospect is responding and reacting and body language and all those cues. Interesting. So my first takeaway that I've written down is that low performing advisors speak 70 to 80% of the time yeah. in an initial conversation. That is that something I can go around quoting with folks now? Yeah, you know, we we have done our 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 company does a lot of virtual training and we also uh, you know do a lot of virtual kind of monitoring of sales calls and simulations and all that kind of thing. So we have I I, I started my career actually in New York um, and I actually <laughs> one of my clients was Lehman Brothers. We may have been in the same it was that fifty five water office and I, I was in that office all the time. Uh, but I don't know if you remember in in in, in the, they, you know, they have those chess kind of things that speed chess where you hit the button and it's your turn and then you hit the button the other person's turn and such we kind of do that with with sales calls where we have a stopwatch where we're actually timing the amount of time that and 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 the newer people are to sales um the more they talk and it can get you know over 60 70 in some cases over 80 percent of the time they're talking um, and that's a it is just, it is the biggest mistake you have to switch. The other thing I would mention to you, Jay, is we interviewed 350 uh, sales executives from all industries, not just financial services, but probably half of them were financial services. And we asked them, what are the big mistakes that salespeople make on sales calls that you observe? And uh, the overwhelming response was talking too much and asking poor questions. From that was 350 sales executives or leaders from large organizations. So I think everybody tends to agree on it. So let's go deeper on poor questions. So mm -hmm. what what are the constructs of poor questions, and then more importantly, what makes for great questions? The, 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 there's there's really a lot to that. We could literally probably talk about that all day, but I'll I'll give you just the short version. The biggest problem is closed ended questions. Is is you know, does that make sense? Or um, have you got any questions for me? Or is that something you'd like to hear more about? Or it's it's questions that can be answered with a yes or no. We are all, I think because, and it's really accelerated over the last five, 10, 15 years because of the internet, people's general skepticism, trust in people, trust in organizations we don't know and such. We are, are all pretty tuned as buyers and decision makers on how to swat away sales conversation we don't like. So if I ask you, you know, hey, Jay, would you like to hear more about that? Or, hey, Jay, does that make sense? You can very easily respond with, hey, yeah, Mike, that makes a lot of sense. You know, why don't you send me a PDF on that? And I'll, you know, talk to my wife or about it, or I'll talk to my accountant or my attorney, and, and, and I'll get back to you on that. And that's, it's, it's very difficult to recover from that. It's not that you can't, it just, the conversation gets kind of greasy when, <laughs> you know, you respond with, well, Jay, what is it you'd like to talk to your accountant about? I mean, that's just, that gets into a weird zone that you know starts to violate trust or whatever. So you want to avoid these closed-ended questions where you explain what you do and you say, "Would you like to hear more?" That is the that habit is far and away the one that we notice that generates the poorest results. Okay, so getting that out of the way, the 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 one that the the questioning technique we really teach and coach our clients it has to do with what we call a menu approach. It's very effective in new prospect meetings where the prospect may or may not even know how to respond. You know, Steve Jobs used to say, if you ask people, if you ask customers what they want, um, they will put you out of business. And, and what he was trying to get across with that is that, you know, customers, clients, prospects, they often don't know what their needs are. So a menu question for an advisor might be something like this. You know, Jay, in, in speaking with, with families like yours that have a you know, substantial amount of wealth, have put a lot of money away, there's a few things that I hear from them that really seem to resonate or seem to be issues they're thinking about. One of them is they want to have a rock solid plan where they absolutely, under no circumstances, up markets, down markets, or flat markets, they will never outlive their money. They want to have a rock solid plan on that. The second thing is they want a, a sort of an investment plan that minimizes taxes. The third is they don't want to overpay for you know, the services. They want it to be, be offered at a really, really fair rate. 
And, and the final thing is they want somebody that they can trust, that's giving them advice that is in their best interest and not necessarily to sell, sell them a product. So, you know, of those four things I mentioned, tell me which one seems to be front and center for you and explain to me why. So now I've given them four ways to go to respond, to connect with what I'm talking about, you know, and just from experience, you know, at least half the time, if not more, they're going to say, listen, I don't ever want to outlive my money. <laughs> Almost everybody, right. that is their number one concern. If you can get the trust built up. So menu questions are really good where you, where you bring out ways that they can respond to. And then you ask them, why is that one a concern of yours? Tell me a little bit more about it. Why did that particular one resonate with you? And it gets them to open up. All right. So uh, outliving your money, taxes, trust. What was the fourth one? Outliving your money, taxes. I mean, it could be any. I, I just kind of randomly picked four. But in this okay. one, I said they don't want to outlive their money. They don't want uh, to have taxes. They, they want to minimize their taxes. They want to have somebody they could, that they could trust. Sometimes it's they want to have a rock solid retirement plan. It could be um, they want to have, depending on if it's a patriarch kind of multi generational family, it could be something like they want to have a plan to pass their estate with the least amount of hassle, the least amount of taxes, and that really works on. And so sometimes with a multi generational family, it's they want an advisor that can work with their heirs to really prepare them for this, you know, for the event that is eventually going to happen. If I'm speaking to a recent divorcee, for instance, or a, a, a somebody that got inheritance, inheritance that's not real financially fluent, it might be, you know, the things that I hear is they don't want to outlive their money. They want to invest it in a way that is really going to, going to, going to work, but they also want an advisor that can educate them on how is the best, you know, what are the best decisions? And they want somebody that can go into those meetings with their accountant and their trust attorney and help guide them through that. So which of those resonate? So see, I'm, I'm tailoring it to the person. I love it. The customization of the menu approach. You yeah. know, on the back end of that, when I work with advisors on their actual presentation, we talk about the three things that really hurt clients over the long haul. And that's paying too much in fees, paying too much in taxes and underperformance. And you could tie those menu questions exactly. right into that in part of the presentation. And I love the way you give the prospect the option to let you know what they mm -hmm. want to talk about. You know, I just remembered the one that I asked, which is conflict free advice. That, by the way, is a huge one. Every time we test that with prospects, that one comes out is advice that's in your best interest. You know, almost everybody feels like they've been stung with an, a piece of investment advice. They got into a private equity fund, for instance, that had ginormous fees or, you know, it locked them up from a liquidity standpoint, or they got into a fixed income position that, you know, oh, took yeah. a giant dive when the market went down because it was ultra correlated to equities. So it's those kinds of, you know, did you get, they, they want conflict interest free advice, whereas a lot of advisors, you know, they're making advice that's based on what's what's in it for me. What's the <laughs> what's the fee payout or whatever. That's and true. I think it really resonates with prospects when you come back at them and say, listen, my advice is going to be in your best interest, especially if you're a fiduciary. Boy, if you if you work in a firm where you are a fiduciary and you don't make a big deal out of that, you are really uh, wasting an opportunity. Michael, I've been surprised at how many RIAs that are fiduciaries do not lead with that or at least have it in their messaging. And, you know, that's actually gives us a great opportunity to pivot to sales messaging. But mm. Before we do that, could you tell listeners and viewers a little bit about Sales Gym and what you offer financial advisors? Well, Sales Gym was developed about five years ago. I started my career doing live training programs and have done thousands of them around the world, mostly for financial services firms. And they're typically one, two or three day seminars and such. And what we found is that those are great for getting a lot of information out quickly. There's a lot of benefits to getting, you know, a group of 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 people together in a room and, you know, the, the company uh, collaboration, all that kind of thing. But people tend to forget a very high percentage of what they learn. So the sales gym was designed around a study we did around sports coaching, because we really believe that there are three types of coaches in the world that are the absolute, you know, elite world class, you know, sports coaches that coach world class teams, obviously one military coaches, especially at the special ops level are incredible coaches and trainers and then performing arts, you know, directors that get a Broadway show together or that, uh, that conduct an orchestra or whatever. They're very good at coaching and training. And what they do is they do 
training in smaller, more intense kind of pieces spread out over a period of weeks. So Sales Gym is really designed that way. We worked with advisors in weekly practice sessions, very practice drill based over a period of anywhere from 10 to 15 weeks. And it has an enormous impact on what we call verbal sales fluency. So Sales Gym is coaching the way sports teams do it in a nutshell. Excellent. And where could listeners and viewers find more information about Sales Gym? If they go to salesgym.com, there are a number of interesting kind of downloads that you can get there um, and easy ways for you to contact and talk to us about you or your organization or a team that you manage um, and how to really nail your value proposition, get better questions, closing techniques, how to position yourself as being uh, different from your competitors, all that kind of thing. Yeah, I encourage viewers and listeners to go to salesgym.com and download the white paper that is on the website on how top performing athletes are a great model for building out your sales program. Is that fair, Michael? Yeah, yeah. And our, our sales gym YouTube channel is great too. There's all kinds of videos, many of them that are are actually you know quite uh, focused on financial services. Excellent. So, Michael, if advisors want to get better, if they want to become world class at sales messaging, what do they need to do? Well, the, the first thing you need to do is you need to think in terms of the way a prospect thinks, an investor thinks. Um, and what is it that they're interested in? You know, they're interested in a person that's trustworthy. They're interested in why should I switch? I mean, especially if you're dealing with high net worth people, why should I switch from what I have now to you? Because there's a lot of hassle involved in that. Uh, you know, Jay, as you know, I mean, there could be especially with markets as high as they are now, there's probably massive capital gains exposure and, and just you know, a lot of advisors just need to refresh their memory of what it means to switch your accounts. <laughs> the industry does not make it easy to do that you know, on purpose. And so there's a lot of hassle, there's tax exposure, all that kind of thing. So you really have to, to understand, the prospect needs to understand what's better about, what am I gonna get that's gonna improve my situation? So we, we talk about this in sales messaging. I think one of the most powerful things of all is what we call client-oriented phrasing. And if I was to answer the question for, for a prospect saying, you know, Mike, what is it that makes your practice different from all the rest of them out there? If I use my voice or my, you know, my opinion, I could say, you know, what really I, I think makes us different is our financial planning process is, is quite unique and it's thorough and it's really focused on the issues that matter to you, your goals, your objectives, um, and more importantly, your concerns about running out of money, putting together a really good spending investment kind of relationship so you understand how that all works. So that's my opinion. Um, but if I use customer oriented phrasing, it's gonna be more like this. It's gonna be, you know, Jay, I, I think the best way for me to answer that question is to tell you what our clients say. And if you were to call our clients and say, what makes you know Mike's practice and team different? The first thing they're gonna tell you is it's, it really boils down to financial planning. They would say something like, you know, when I first met Mike's team, they talked about financial planning and I've been through that process before, but I have to tell you, when I went through it with them, it was so eye-opening. Um, why, not only did they ask about my goals and my objectives, but they got to such a level of depth about you know my concerns and our fears and 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 just mistakes we made in the past that the financial plan really fit me and my wife and my family. And for the first time, we were able to stick to it. We understood it. We stuck with it, and it has been just that foundation for us to achieve what we want. And I think Jay, if you talk to our clients, you're going to find that that's very unique. So maybe I could start by asking you, tell me a little bit about the financial planning experience you've had in the past with your advisors, how effective it was, what might have been missing, and just in general, how it could have been better for you. So now I share my client's opinion, and I always end it with a question that's going to get you to talk about your experience on that issue in the past. That's one of the most important things people, financial advisors, can learn when they start talking like that wow, does it open up the conversation? Got it. And it clearly ties into the menu concept we were, you were talking about earlier. And you could have a series of those questions that are predicated upon their answers earlier. Uh, you talk about headlining. And so how do you construct headlines that help drive this process? So headlines are short. When you think of a headline, you know, you, we, we probably all drop back for those of us that ever read newspapers. You know, we saw headlines in newspapers, right? And the headline is, is a curiosity gen generating magnet that causes the person to say, wow, tell me more, or I, I'm interested enough to read the article. And that's the same thing in, uh, you know, in sales. So I'll, I'll give you an example in my own business in sales, Jim, and then I'll, I'll sort of do it for, you know, financial services. So if somebody was to, 
ask me, you know, tell me how sales team works, I might use a headline like I'd say, you know, two things that really jump out is first, we coach the way sports teams do. And secondly, we have found that sales messaging is the key to becoming a top performer. So those are two short headlines. And chances are, if you were a sales executive, you'd be like, huh, tell me about this sports and oriented coaching, right? Yep. So now, obviously, I'm going to give more underneath that. That's where the customer oriented phrasing might come in. So as a financial financial advisor, let's say I had an advisory where I really had great financial planning, or let's say I had a, a, an approach that really reduced unnecessary risk. So I might I might use those two. So I might say, you know, Jay, uh, what, our, what my clients tell me is that our financial process, uh, planning process is absolutely unique and different from all other advisors they work with. And the second thing is, is we have a way of reducing risk that is very unique in our industry. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. So I've given you two headlines that I'm now going to explain in detail. They're very, very important. So if, if, if an advisor you know, and their team, if I ask them a question, I say, what makes your team different from other advisors that your prospects are working with or, or that your clients are also using, You know, especially high net worth clients, many times have two or three advisors they work with. If they can't really rattle off four or five great headlines, it, you know, it, chances are they're going to be less effective in the sales interaction. Mm -hmm. You just have to be able to talk about what makes you unique and different and headlines drive that. So I, you know, you were talking about memorization. It, it probably helps to get those short things pretty close to dialed in, mm -hmm. but then be able to spontaneously and conversationally explain what they mean. Well, I got to tell you, Michael, we very quickly crossed the 20 minute mark, which is where mm -hmm. I like to cut these podcasts and vlogs off. But I'd want to ask you another another question, if it's all right, sure. if you have a few more minutes. I do. Absolutely. All right. So, Michael, what I really appreciate about the work that you and your team at Sales Gym do is you differentiate between top performers and everybody else. Instead of presenting research that everybody does, it's the top performers. So what are top performers doing that everybody else is not? God, boy, that's a big, that's a big question. We could go on into a, a lot of directions, but I think, you know, the, the one thing they do is they do lead generation better. And obviously this COVID situation is, is, is a challenge for, for advisors because they're not out there, they're not meeting, they're not shaking hands and all that kind of thing. It's more of a challenge. I'm finding that the top performers I deal with are, are putting together virtual events, more of them, good ones, so that they can call people and invite them to that. So I think that's one of them. You got to keep your lead generation funnel and machine really working. The other thing that top performers do that is just, it, it, they just close better, Jay. I mean, they always are offering suggestions. The worst way to close was close is, so Jay, are you ready to get started? Or so Jay, are you ready to do the paperwork to get you know an account open? That's the, you know, that's really dumb closing methodology. Really good top performers always close with options. They get so good at offering alternatives that they'll say something like, you know, Jay, what at this point in, in, in the process and in the conversation, what tends to happen with my clients is, is, is that become our clients, they go in one of two directions. Some of them feel comfortable getting started with the paperwork and getting going, um, and putting together kind of a process by deadlines by which they want to fund it and get all of it done. Others like to kind of test drive or get a second opinion by us so that we do a little bit of analysis of their current portfolio and we can show them um, some thoughts about how we might suggest their portfolio could be adjusted to generate better returns with less risk. Which direction would you feel more comfortable going at this point? And so they give an option and either option moves the, the, the process forward. I would tell you that for everybody out there listening, if they haven't mastered ending conversations with options, they are leaving money on the table always. So you open with a menu option, you close with a menu option. Yeah, we're in a world of options. You went right in 2020, everything has options. Everything, every product you buy is, is there's, there's 15 different choices you have to go through in order to, to, to identify it. I just bought, I just, I needed to get a new uh, you know, computer a couple of weeks ago, I really literally went through 10 minutes of menus and choices to get that thing dialed in. That's just, we're used to that. Everything is choices. So you present choices. It's never yes or no. It's which is the better fit. Which one makes better sense? Which what, which direction would you like to go now? So it's you always avoid the yes or no because yes or no makes it very easy for them to say, hey, that's interesting. Let me talk to my accountant and my attorney about it first. 
Michael, there are times that I produce these shows and I feel like I learn just as much as my audience. Here are my <laughs> takeaways from today. And if you, if you didn't notice, I was taking notes during this conversation. <laughs> Number one, the menu approach at the beginning is it's just pure gold. Uh, the virtual events, I can tell you from my experience with my clients, the top performers are doing virtual events. One of the better ideas I've seen here recently, and this was actually done for a charity, was a virtual whiskey tasting. So you, went and you picked up a couple of sample bottles and then you had all of your clients on a Zoom screen, very interactive, very engaging. I thought that was excellent. And then closing with menu options as well. Michael, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing. This has been a really, really impactful episode. Tell listeners again where they can find out more information about you and Sales Gym. Best place to go is to salesgym.com. That's one word, S-A-L-E-S-G-Y-M.com. There's all kinds of downloads and ways to get a hold of us. I would also suggest you go to the YouTube uh, Sales Gym channel and subscribe to it. Videos come out every week on techniques like this that uh, you know, and much, much more that can help you to sell the way top performers do. And coach, um, and those of you that are in a coaching role where you're trying to build a team, how to coach the way world-class um, elite coaches, sports team coaches do it. Excellent. Michael, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it.